Um, just by way of background, Chris Lee is my name. Um, I say to Ryan, you, you are Internet of Things, IoT. Many years ago, I was IoT when it meant Inspector of Taxes, which I was an Inspector <laughs> of Taxes. It's, it's, um, I stopped doing that. I saw the lights many years ago and I've been a, a tax advisor for a good many years. But in recent years, I've had my own business. Fiscability UK is mainly me, and I do a lot of work with early stage companies, you know, all sorts of tax issues that are, are relevant to them. What am I going to talk about? Well, there are two um, enterprise investment schemes, the, the, the EIS and the SEED Enterprise Investment Scheme, SEIS. You'll know by the end of it what the difference is. Why do they matter to you? A bit about the history, what the tax reliefs are, who can qualify. Also, it may be relevant to you as founders of businesses in some cases. Then what shares qualify, what companies qualify. The whole process and where you may get it wrong and the consequences of that. After you heard from me, you won't ever get it wrong. Ah, this is the one where it builds, so I can give it backwards and forwards. So why does it matter? Well, there are very effective tax reliefs, and if you have UK taxpaying individuals investing in your company, they will almost certainly want the tax relief. No, it's very highly relevant to them. Um, and we're in an era where other tax shelters are being challenged, and we're all sorts of tax schemes around of dubious legality and morality, um, those are being challenged a lot by HM Revenue. Um, so people are more looking for tax relief, putting money into EIS and SEIS schemes. And if you can't offer the tax relief, you're at a competitive disadvantage to companies which can offer it. And there are EIS and SEIS funds around, which may be valuable sources of money for your companies. Um, there are things called venture capital trusts, which are perhaps a little bit larger, but there's all similar organisations. And many of you will know about crowdfunding. Um, there are various crowdfunders who, who will help you raise funds. Mm. So no, these reliefs no, really sort of help you to raise money for your business and give people tax breaks you know, as, as a return for doing that. And so, actually, I should have said at the start, do jump in with questions if you want. Um, I'm very happy to lecture you for the next three quarters of an hour, but if we have a dialogue, it's more fun for me and probably more fun for you, but you don't have to. Oh, yeah, and, and, and these things can, can be good for you as founders. So, what's the history? Well, um, the history of some venture capital reliefs in the UK go back to 1981. And I was actually around doing that at the time, when I was an IOT. Um, most of you weren't even born then, but never mind. I'm just old. Um, but the, the, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, as we have it today, dates from 1994, replaced something called the BES, which was similar in some ways. It's changed a lot over the years, particularly more recently, to comply with EU regulations. In EU terms, EIS is a state aid, and therefore it has to fit in with you know, EU state aid guidance. Um, what will happen post-Brexit? Who knows? I mean, I don't think they've thought about that yet, but it, it, it may well loosen up a bit. Um, SEIS, Senior Enterprise Investment Scheme, is much more recent, came in in 2012. That, that's a, a, a sort of bottom end, sort of small scale scheme, as you'll see, but with you know, enhanced tax breaks. These schemes are policed by the HMRC, Inland Revenue as was. They have two small company enterprise centres, SCECs as they're known. Um, there's one in Cardiff and there's one in Mainston. And they will offer advance assurances to let you know if your company is going to qualify or not. More of that later. And actually, they're generally quite helpful. Um, they're not the sort of tax inspectors who are out to sort of trip you up and get you. No, no, they are people you can talk to and have a sensible dialogue. And just to get an idea of the scale, um, by the April 2015, which is obviously sort of 18 months ago now, 24,000 odd companies had raised well over £14 billion under EIS. 
Um, and in that year, there was no, over 1.8 million. And the stats are always, by definition, a bit behind, behind the curve, because they only pick up the stats when people file their tax returns. Um, almost certainly now, I, I guess there's probably 17 or 18 billion being raised to date on, on the EIS. Um, SEIS, much, you know, much newer and smaller sums are raised. But again, in 1415, £175 million pounds went into that. So you know, they, there is a, a chunky amount of money going in there. I won't mention the bottom two any more, other than that, that they are other reliefs which are vaguely similar. So, what is, S what is EIS? Now, why does it matter to your investors? Well, it's a package of tax reliefs. And the first one is income tax relief on the money they put in. You have an investor puts in £20,000 into your company. They get a £6,000, 30% tax credit to offset against the income tax they would otherwise pay. And they can put in up to a million pounds a year, and actually they can carry it back if they want to the previous tax year. So in some cases, they can put in up to two million pounds. Um, that's across all companies generally, not just into one company. So that's the first relief, upfront income tax relief. Then if they, your investor hangs in there for three years, well at least three years, and there's no sort of breach of the EIS rules, any gain they make on selling the shares is entirely tax-free. So, uh, tax relief on the way in, tax exemption on the way out. Now, sadly, um, there isn't always a capital gain on exiting businesses. Um, fact of life, a good many fail. There is more income tax relief on failed exits. And adding together the various reliefs one can get, you know, up to 61.5% on a complete failure, um, effectively is a tax subsidy from, from, from the tax system. Put the other way around, that's a 38.5% tax cost, well, it's a 38.5% investment cost um, for the person who puts money into your company. Um, I won't mention this, this one in great detail, but if, if people have made capital gains on selling other assets. They might have sold a second home or a share portfolio, for example. They can get some relief on that. The final one isn't actually an EIS relief at all. It is quite an important one, especially for older investors, many of whom will, will, want, will, will, will build up a portfolio of shares in trading companies. Inheritance tax is charged when someone dies at 40%. If you get business property relief, you pay 0%, and you get that by holding shares in trading companies, private trading companies. You have to hold them for two years. So a lot of people will you know, maybe not even want the income tax relief, but they will hold you know, shares in trading companies um, for the inheritance tax relief, so their estate doesn't suffer tax, or doesn't suffer so, so much tax. Similarly, there are five tax reliefs for, for, for SEIS. Um, now, EIS, you'll remember, was 30% income tax relief. SEIS is 50%. But the maximum any individual can put in in any tax year is £100,000. Again, there's a carry back to the previous year, which may make up £200,000 in total. Although, in fact, no one company can ever raise more than £150,000, as we'll see later. And that means if you do have someone, someone I guess fairly wealthy, putting in £200,000 at once, they've got to have at least two companies to invest in, so you can get together with one of your friends. Um, so that's the income tax relief, no more than it was under EIS. The capital gains tax exemption is exactly the same. Hang on in there for three years, no tax on exit. If you sold your second home or something like that, and you invest in SEIS shares, half the gain on selling that second home will become tax exempt. And, that, and that, unlike the, the EIS equivalent, which I glossed over, which is a deferral of tax, the tax is due eventually, this is a, 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 an exemption. Um, 
So people who actually realize a capital gain, let's say selling a share portfolio, for example, may be a very fruitful source of SEIS investment because they'll know how much tax they can shelter. Again, you get income tax loss relief on any failed exit. So with SEIS, remember with EIS, I said the, the tax subsidy was up to 61.5%. For SEIS, it's actually up to 86.5%. In other words, the investment cost is 13.5% of what your investor puts in. Um, bizarrely, and I mentioned this came in in 2012, and it was announced up now a year, well, six months or so ahead, what the reliefs were going to be. And I read through it all. I read a little press release came out from HMRC. And I thought, well, that will give you 103% tax relief in some circumstances. How can you possibly have 103% tax relief? I must have got it wrong. And I was doing a press release you know, from the firm I was working for at the time. And I chickened out of putting 103%, because I thought, I'm, you know, I just got this wrong. But actually it was. For the first year of SEIS, you could get 103% tax relief on a company that completely failed. Which was crazy, but there you were. I don't think many people invested just for that, but, yeah, nice theory. And the inheritance tax is exactly the same as it was for EIS. Who qualifies? You know, what investors can you approach to get SEIS or EIS investment? Well, anyone who has UK income tax liability can benefit. It doesn't matter where they live. So, you know, I've got recently been with someone living in Bermuda. It happens this person in Bermuda has a lot of UK rental properties, pays a lot of UK income tax. So he was quite keen on EIS relief. Um, People mustn't be connected with the companies, and they can't generally be company employees. Um, and there are some complicated rules for, for directors, which I will sort of gloss over now. Um, an EIS investor can't hold more than 30% of a company. And that's called a material interest, if you have 30%. Um, and that's looking at shares or votes or whatever in the company. So, you know, it's, it's a sub-30% investment for any one person. And in looking at that 30%, you add together someone's associates, so they're, 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 they're some of their relatives, you know, their, their husband or wife, for example, or their business partners. So if I and my father each held 20% in a company, we'd be treated as effectively holding 40% each, and neither of us could qualify for that EIS relief. Um, this, this is a rule that came in, in, in uh, only last year. If you have existing shareholders who are now putting in money for a further investment, they only get the tax relief if their existing shares were either the founder shares from the very start of the business or those existing shares had themselves qualified for SEIS or EIS. And that's tripped up quite a few people because they've had some existing shares that they got, I don't know, through bought from an existing shareholder or something, and that's now disqualifying them from EIS relief. And that is, um, uh, I maybe haven't stressed this enough, the only way you can EIS is by subscribing for new shares. You can't get EIS or SEIS relief on buying existing shares from another shareholder. Which, if you think about it, is logical, because what this is doing, it's encouraging, you know, through the tax system, investment into companies. And so, you know, if I buy Ryan's shares, well, why the hell should I get tax relief on that? And if I put money into your company, I should get tax relief. That's not an offer of investment, by the way. <laughs> um, there is something, again, I won't come into detail, called business investment relief. This is um, for non-domiciled people um, who get extra tax breaks sometimes. So if you can get someone like Roman Abramovich, who will be non-domiciled, uh, one of your investors, he can almost sort of double up his tax relief. Mm. And he speaks to many, many people. And then it's in Russian when he does. Mm. Relief for, for founders in a business. No, 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 no this is this for you. Now, most founders invest their time, 
rather than putting a lot of money into the business. So the income tax relief on these EIS and SEIS may not be so important to you. However, you, know, you hope that you know, your shares in the fullness of time will be sold for many millions of pounds and you'll have a, a huge capital gain, which would be taxable unless you could bring your shares within the scope of one of these reliefs. Or if you, lived, you, know, if you went to live in the Channel Islands or Cayman or something, but you, know, you may well be able to get relief yourself under EIS or SEIS, perhaps only on putting in a few hundred pounds for shares. So you put in, I don't know, 500 pounds, you get 250 pounds in income tax relief. You may as well claim it, it's worth having. But then when you make your million pounds in exit, that you know, can be entirely tax free. Um, but no, bear in mind, though, that this can't apply to a founder who has more than 30% of a company because of that general rule that EIS and SEIS doesn't apply to these material interest shareholders who have more than 30%. So if it's just your company, well, then you're not going to qualify. If it's you and one other, or you and two others, you probably won't qualify. But let's say there were four of you, and that's the ideal. Four people, each earning 25%, now that's spot on for claiming you know, SEIS relief on your initial investment. <coughs> and if you're in that situation, you know, talk to someone like me before you go and form the company. Because I've seen numerous companies you know, thinking, oh, I wish I'd done this but they've actually formed the company and gone too far down the road with their existing company. I mean, there was literally this week, I had a call with that one of the FinTech cohort um, from, um, was it Ray McInlough, you know, who says, oh, well, I think I can do this. And I think he's scrapping his existing company and starting again with a new one just for the tax relief, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but and he also wants to do it himself and not take advice, so he'll probably cock it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I say, can be complex, take advice. So, what shares qualify for, 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 for EIS and SEIS? Well, I mean, the, the simple answer is that most ordinary shares in a company will qualify. They have to be paid for in cash, you can't convert a loan, so someone puts cash into ordinary shares in your company, they should, they should be EIS or SEIS qualifying. They can't have some preferential rights to dividends or to assets or winding up the company and so on. There mustn't be guaranteed exits. You can't say to someone, well, you, know, you put in £100,000 into my company and I guarantee you'll get £150,000 back in three years' time. Now that doesn't work. You know, this, is, this is risk capital we're talking about. Companies can raise um, a maximum of £5 million under these various venture capital schemes in any rolling 12-month period. Um, I, I suspect at the moment you're not looking to be spending like £5 million within 12 months, so that's pretty irrelevant to you, but maybe one day in the future. Under EIS, there is a, a 12 million lifetime maximum for most companies, or 20 million pounds for some sort of heavily R&D type companies, they're called knowledge intensive companies. Um, whereas for SEIS, as I mentioned earlier, the lifetime maximum is 150,000 pounds. So what you very often get is a company, let's say wants to raise well, no, it's able to raise half a million pounds you know, to get started. It's done quite well raising an initial half a million pounds. And that will often put the first 150 under SEIS and then 350 under EIS. You know, and it, can, it can't all do it on, all on the same day, but it can do it with just one day in between. I mentioned earlier that these are state aids under EU regulations. Um, and there is an interaction with other state aims you might get, um, and that applies especially to SEIS if you have grants which fall under EU de minimis rules. So it's, you know, if you do get grants and so on, and you're looking at SEIS, worth taking advice on you know, the interaction and whether one of them will preclude the other. Point 
qualifying companies. What companies qualify? I guess this, this, this is one of the important issues. Well, at the point of investment, when people subscribe for shares in your company, it must not be listed on the stock exchange. AIM, which is a junior market, that's actually okay. Um, it must not have gross assets. That's the top half of the balance sheet of more than 200,000. That's for SEIS. For EIS, it's 15 million. For SEIS, must have fewer than 25 full-time employees. Yeah, I mean, two, half, two half-time employees count as one full-time. 254 for EIS. Mustn't be in difficulty, and there's some financial tests on that. Effectively, because it's a state aid, um, the system doesn't allow to, to sort of subsidise businesses which are just going to go bust in the near future. And there's a whole lot of anti-avoidance around this, as you, as you might imagine, because of these tax reliefs. And there mustn't be sort of arrangements that effectively you know, push the tax relief around in circles or uh, somebody invests and gets money back and so on. That's all quite complex, but you know, a straightforward equity investment in the sort of companies which I believe you have you know, isn't going to be a problem there. So those are the tests you have when the money goes in. Then there are various other tests that have to be met normally for the, the next three years. And one of the key ones is the company must, that issues the shares must have a UK permanent establishment. What does that mean? It means that that share issuing company must have a fixed place of business in the United Kingdom. So it's perfectly possible to have, for example, I'm working at the moment with an Estonian company. I've worked in the recent past with an Israeli company. Both of those have issued EIS qualifying shares on the basis that they have a sort of branch operation in the UK. I mean, the Israeli one, most of its business is either in Israel or in California. But it does have a small office in London and that small office in London is the basis on which it's been able to raise, to date, more than half a million pounds of, of EIS money. It doesn't matter that the money will actually be spent in California, which it will be, because it has that UK permanent establishment, it does qualify. Um, and I know some of you do have overseas connections and overseas companies. You know, think about whether you have the UK permanent establishment, or think about as with a, a Lithuanian company, which I'm working with also at the moment, whether that, I think what that will do is it'll probably have a, a UK parent company put on top of the Lithuanian company, which is another way of doing it. The company mustn't be controlled by another company. So you can't get these tax reliefs on investing into a subsidiary company. No, it must, and if there's a group of companies, it's the top company in the group. Mustn't have a trade carried on by anybody else. So you mustn't you know, kind of some business partnerships involved. Again, um, these are tests that apply for that this three-year period. The company must either, and ignoring any incidental purpose, forgive me if I bring this definition, exist wholly for the purpose of carrying on one or more qualifying trades. And then there's a second definition that applies if you have a group of companies. That definition applies to the, the parent company of a group. So what, what you get from these definitions is that the company that's being invested in must be wholly, or to a very large extent, you know, a trading company. You know, and there are, as you'll see in a moment, there are, you know, some trades that don't qualify. So it can't be a property investment company, for example, you know, because that's not even not a trading company. It can't be a company that invests in shares in other companies, again, and receives dividends. That's not a trading company. So there are various trades which don't qualify. They're called excluded activities. And those are things to do with like, some property, um, banking and finance. Um, accountants and lawyers can't qualify. I think the tax system thinks they're crooks, and they're probably right, but um, so they can't benefit from these reliefs. Um, for the companies that you're dealing with, 
I think in most cases, um, you know, the activity you're having would not be an excluded one. One that you might need to think about is that leasing is, and licensing are generally excluded activities. So what you can't do is have you know, a product, and it's a big piece of kit, which you then lease out. You know, that would not be a qualifying activity. And if you're granting a license, that may not be, but with an important exception, because obviously a lot of tech companies will enter into licensing deals, if what you're licensing is a so-called relevant intangible asset, you're okay. What's a relevant intangible asset? It's one that you created yourself, effectively. So if you created you know, some IP, and you then license that IP to whoever, then that should be okay, because you're licensing a relevant intangible asset. But if you can buy in that IP, or buy in something else, then and lease or license it, that won't qualify. EIS companies need to employ, effectively, or spend the money within two years from the investment coming in. Um, funds must be raised to promote business growth and development. You can't just use it to sort of pay off existing debt, for example. And very often, HMRC will want to see a business plan at the point the money goes in, you know, to understand what you're going to do with the money. And you can't use these tax reliefs to raise money to purchase an existing business or indeed to purchase existing intellectual property. SEIS is a bit similar, except you've got three years to spend the funds. Um, it's only £150,000, so most people spend it in about three months, I find. But, um, but SEIS must be an investment into a new qualifying trade. That's one that's not been carried on by anyone more than two years previously. So the revenue will look at the company concerned, and if you bought the business from someone else, they'll look at the previous owner. If it goes back more than two years, then SEIS relief will not be available because it's not a, it's not a new qualifying trade. Um, yeah, the, the, the EIS or SEIS funds must be employed by the company or by its 90% subsidiary. So if you have a subsidiary which is only, let's say, 75% owned, you couldn't use SEIS or EIS money in that. And that can give problems sometimes with such subsidiaries and with joint ventures. There are restrictions, as from last year, on EIS money coming to companies that are more than seven years old. Um, from your point of view, that's not a bad thing, I suspect, because most of your companies won't be more than seven years old. It means that money's you know, coming away from those older companies towards newer companies such as yours. So what do you actually do in practice? You know, how do you go about getting this relief? Well, obviously, first of all, you, know, you have to have an investor that is stating the obvious, and I'm not going to talk about how you find an investor. Other people will tell you about that. But one thing you might want to do before you get an investor is apply to HMRC for advance assurance as to the qualifying status of your company. And advance assurance is an inland revenue phrase. It means their confirmation that if your company issues shares, they will be qualifying shares for SEIS or EIS. Not a legal requirement that you get that, but many investors will want to have that. They'll say, I'm not putting my money into your company unless you can prove to me that I will get the tax relief. And a lot of companies do apply. In the 14-15 tax year, 6,000 companies actually applied for advance assurance of which 87% were successful, which I find that actually quite intriguing. It means 13% were unsuccessful, and I don't know why, but it means something like one in eight of applicants you know, failed before they even got started. I mean, it'd be interesting to know why they were failing, whether they, sort of went, whether they were just hopeless basket cases, or whether they went back and tinkered with the model. Yeah. Um, there's no real time limit on it. Um, it's important when you make the application that you disclose all the relevant facts. 
So if you don't tell them everything, then you know, they may give you advance assurance, later on discover, well, you hadn't mentioned some sort of key information, and they, they, they'd revoke it. But if you sort of go in with full information, and six months, 12 months later, you know, that still, still applies, then the advance assurance will still apply. So there's no sort of formal time limit. It's for, for so long as the circumstances still fit what you've told them. If you look on the HMRC website, you will see there is a form. Um, they're not very clever in thinking of form names. It's an EIS of the SEIS brackets AA, Advanced Assurance Form. And you can fill in that form and send it off to HMRC, to one of these small company enterprise centres, and use that as the basis for getting an advanced assurance. I recommend you never ever do that. Because in my view, that form is almost encouraging you not to give full information. Now, if you're not familiar with you know, the, the whole process, you can, it would be all too easy inadvertently to omit some key fact. You know, for example, about the company ownership or something like that. So what I do is I actually write, uh, write uh, a letter. And I, I, I do this for many, many companies. And I think they go through every test in the legislation and say why it's met. You know, I say the company has fewer than 25 employees. Which obviously it does, it's only got any employees quite possibly. But no, you state the obvious and then there never can be any doubt about it. And then obviously if there are contentious issues, those are all brought out. If you get the advance assurance, then you can rely upon it. So no, it's your choice. I mean, you, know, you can use the form. That's why it's published. But I, I personally wouldn't recommend it. So you've now possibly, if you've chosen to, got your advance assurance. One issue you need to bear in mind is it'll typically take at least six weeks to get it. So you're not going to get it overnight. And sometimes you need to build that into your investment process. But you've got the, the, the advance assurance. You now issue your SEIS shares, assuming that you're an SEIS company. You raise your first £150,000. After you've spent 70% of the money, or after you've actually been trading for four months, you apply formally to HMRC for the tax relief. And that you do on um, a form SEIS 1, and all being well, they reply and say, yep, you can issue certificates, which are forms SEIS 3. And the process is very much the same for, for, for EIS, um, which ha may, may happen next. So you then have these certificates, and HMRC will send you, if you list 20 investors on one of the forms, they'll send you 20 blank certificates. You fill them in, send them to the 20 investors, they then claim tax relief you know, through their own tax return. You know, your involvement has really ended at that stage. The only thing you might have to do is if you, your company became non-compliant for some reason, let's say you sold the company, um, then you have to tell the revenue about that. Mm. Getting it wrong. Um, well, there are lots of things where, where you can get it wrong. I mean, selling the company in less than three years, I'm not saying that's getting it wrong. If you have an offer that's too good to refuse, well, you'll sell the company. But that would result in a, a clawback in the tax relief. But things like joint ventures and partnerships, I mentioned change of trade, you, know, you suddenly start leasing your kit rather than selling it, for example. Um, those can result in, 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 a, in a loss of tax relief. And if the relief is lost, HMRC will claw back some or all of the income tax relief that your investor got. And then when they sell their shares, any gain they make will be liable to capital gains tax. And so the message I think I, I, I'd say is, you know, before you do anything major with your company, any sort of corporate deal, you know, major new product deals, you know, whatever it might be, you know, take advice on the tax consequences. And there's a company which, actually, is one I've invested into myself. I, well, I think so. It's going to succeed. They are now invited to do a joint venture in Abu Dhabi. 
and you know, I'm advising on that. It's, I'm actually advising for free in that case, because it's very close to my own heart, obviously. And I think we can get round that. But you know, if they'd just gone in and done this Abu Dhabi joint venture, as it was first suggested, I think they'd have had real problems. I mentioned that any advance assurance is only as good as the information given to HMRC. You don't disclose the full facts. You can hardly be surprised if they come back and revoke the tax relief. I never guarantee to investors that the tax relief will be maintained. You, know, you hope it will be. You'll use your reasonable best endeavours. But you must do what's right commercially. I and mean, if you have a, you know, an offer to sell the business for squillions within two years, well, you're probably going to sell. And that really summarises it. Um, they're highly tax-effective investment reliefs. You're at a competitive disadvantage if you can't offer it to prospective investors, at least if you're going for individual investors. The legislation is quite complex and changes all too frequently. I recommend you take advice um, from someone like, my, like myself. And that's really all I have to say. So um, thank you for coming and happy to answer any questions in the sort of public forum or you can email me separately or we can chat afterwards. Well, whatever you want. But thank you.